I'll tell you guys a story that, that it, the TV people thought I was just maybe not real bright about te te you know, technology, but there was always a button I could turn it off. So I turned it off all the time. <laughs> all the time. And they would send the PR person to come tell me. To, a coach must have accidentally bought. Coach didn't accidentally oh, yeah. bought. I didn't want them hearing what I was saying. <laughs>
one site. Uh, I, I've been all over the country in those situations, and uh, so it it's been a career that has had had different elements of basketball in it, and I'm I'm just very very blessed and fortunate that uh, I've been associated with some great coaches and some great players along the way. Well, um, I had taken over as an interim coach in Charlotte, and we ended the season very well. So it gave me an opportunity to be a candidate for head coaching jobs. Uh, Cleveland had a job. You know, Ohio is my home. Uh, and for me to have an opportunity to come back to Ohio and to, to be the coach of Cleveland. Cleveland has always been a special city to me. You know, my first professional sports experiences, whether it was the Indians at the time or the, the Cavaliers or what have you, I, they all centered around uh, a boy from a little town called Lowell coming to Cleveland. So Cleveland was big time to me in a lot of ways. So to be their coach uh, in the WNBA was very, very, very special, very, very, very exciting. And, and, you know, I was the very beginning of me being a head coach, which I'd end up doing for 20 years, but the coach that, that came out in Cleveland uh, really branded me. It gave me an opportunity to identify with the city, which I really did. Uh, we did promotions with the Rock Hall. I, I was a charter member of the Rock Hall. I've, 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 I've always been incredibly uh, interested in music and, and, and like that. But the, but the general makeup of, of the Rockers what was a team that was 7 and 25 when I came. We went to, I think, 18 and 15 the first year, went to the finals. But they were a hardworking group, you know, led by Susie McConnell Serio and, and Merlakia Jones and and different people that, of that group that, that, were, that were just amazing. Uh, hardworking, talented, and, and, and you could see a bond, to be honest with you. You know, I was uh, looking at some tape last night of th that first year there, and uh, Susie McConnell serial nails a three to put us in the playoffs, and Joe Tate's doing the call. Uh, it was just magic. 10,750 people, I, I heard him say that's what was at the game. And so uh, being tied to the city, to me was just special. It was just special and, and uh, had a lot of good teams during my four years, had a lot of good times during my four years here, um, and felt very blessed to, you know, I, I, woke, I would wake up every morning uh, just celebrating the fact that I was a WNBA coach in Cleveland. Yeah, we went to the conference finals a couple times here. Um, that season, probably the best season we had was 2001 from the standpoint of just success and, and those type of things. crowds uh, and all those type of things just kind of snowballed in the course of that year. Um, it was a team that was still very young in a lot of ways, but they, they definitely uh, were a very, very successful team. You know, uh, defensively still hold most of the, D the uh, WNBA records all these years later. Um, had a special brand of defense in what they did. Uh, best exemplified by a, by a player named Mary Andrade.
Mary Andrade played here for the Rockers in 2001 and, and 2000 and 2002, actually. But in 2001, uh, she was kind of a, a real catalyst defensively. Well, she is now the assistant coach for the Toronto Raptors and still carries that defensive enthusiasm. I mean, that team could really guard. Uh, we scored out of our defense, and so there, you know, that was making shots became important to us in a lot of ways, but defensively incredibly special. I mean, holding teams in the 30s, and that's unheard of professionally. And that, that was a real trademark of those teams. Some really quality wins, some great rivalries with the New York Liberty. Um, you know, that played out year after year. Uh, and they would win a lot of home games. We would win a lot of home games. And you tried to steal one now and again, but just some incredibly powerful uh, matchups with the New York Liberty, who, who became probably our, our big, uh, we had to get through them to get, in a lot of cases, to the finals. Well, I, I've always been a person that really, and, and, and by my career you can see it, I appreciated all kinds of basketball. Started as a high school coach, coached at Division Three, coached at Division One, uh, coached professionally. Uh, my, my home where I watch games, I have three TVs facing one way, three the other, and, and, and it's not unlike, you know, one of them's going to have a women's game, one of them's going to have a college game, one of them may have an NBA game. I appreciate all kinds of basketball and, and, and the culture and the way that it's played. The women's game has its own lane. And I think it's one to be proud of. I think the, the, the skill level, the way they use the pass, the athletic ability and development of that within the years has been uh, incredible to watch. But I like the beauty of the women's game. I, I like the team aspect of the women's game. I like seeing that, and I saw it in my career, the way defenses have to approach great offensive players is continuing to change because they are that special that a single player can literally beat you. And that is, you know the development of players is coming along when you see things like that in regard to it. And I'm just very blessed that, to, to be a part of it and very excited to see what the future takes. Uh, Taking the last year's NCAA tournament, uh, and the parity that I'm seeing develop across the landscape of, of women's college basketball. It's very exciting because it, it creates a situation where you've got a Toledo team. And, and, and I had gone and spoke to the Toledo team before their season. And their goal was to go from good to great. And, and that meant making the NCAA tournament and, and winning the conference tournament. And, and I remember talking to that group. I thought they were a special group. And then they, they accomplished that. They won the regular season, and, and, and Mary and I were there to see them do that. And then uh, they went into the, to the uh, MAC tournament and won that. And then I was doing a broadcast for ESPN, and I'm sitting in Utah. I'm doing the Utah site, and I'm watching. Iowa State, which is coached by Bill Finley, who, who I knew very well from Toledo, and Toledo, and I'm like, you know, this is going to be a great game. Well, it was, and, and Toledo rose up and just played an outstanding basketball game and then went to the next round, I think, to play Tennessee in regard to that, but that is an exact example of the parity that I think is now developing, and I've always appreciated the Mac from a standpoint of, I, I, I think, you know, it has been a, te a league in many ways that other leagues didn't want to have to play <laughs> because they were very capable of what Toledo actually did. Well, I think I'm really fortunate that, that, that my career was t 20 years on the men's side and 22 years on the women's side. And one of the best decisions I ever made was to become a women's basketball coach and women's sports in general. So I got to see the, the climb, and we're still on that climb where, where the ascension of, of attention and the product is being appreciated at a greater and greater level uh, coming through it. And to me, 
Uh, I'm, I'm so excited, not only for today and for Final Four here in Cleveland, I'm excited for what the future is going to bring. Um, it, it's amazing to me to think where this product may go. And I'm just so glad that I'm a basketball coach, but that my last 22 years was on the women's side, and I got to see the growth, the, uh, the, 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 the attention that, that it is now garnering, the development of the players, the, the development of the sport, and I can't wait to see the next 15 years. Well, the, you know, what you do in those situations is you put a bid in, and, and I'm sure the, the Cleveland Sports Commission at that time put a bid in for Cleveland to host uh, the Final Four on the women's side in 207 in what was called Gund Arena then, now Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. But they got, you know, since we were a WNBA team in town, uh, the word got to me, and they said, hey, the committee's going to be here. And for those of us in Cleveland, you know, they, they were walking from Tower City on that little walkway in, into the, the Gund back then. And we were going to meet them as they came into the building, when they were going to tour the building that, that led to it. So I remember having several different dignitaries of Cleveland with us. I, I even remember Katie Smith coming up and joining us and, and just kind of meeting the the committee as they toured uh, the city and, and there. And uh, I remember interacting with different members of the committee and just talking to them, what, what a great spot this would be you know, for, for the city. And then when I saw that we got it, uh, it was just, it, it was very special, um, I think. And that was a very historic 207 uh, uh, game. Uh, Candace Parker in Tennessee and Pat Summit and all those things uh, like that. And, 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 and I'm just, was really glad to have been a part of that event. Oh, absolutely. Um, my job at that Final Four was very, very, very interesting because we also held the WNBA draft the day after the final game. So you would have all the, the, the teams that, that had high draft picks on site. So I'm here uh, for that. So I'm, I'm kind of in a dual role. So I'm watching the games and I, I remember Rutgers play and then I remember uh, Tennessee. I remember uh, Pat Summit had been a real proponent, um, obviously of women's basketball, but I, I mostly remember her. She had, had always been a good friend uh, she did broadcast the WNBA in the early years. So I, I got to know her. She was somebody who opened the door for Dan Hughes in a lot of ways because she took a liking to this guy that, that was new in women's basketball. And, and she was such a great ambassador to, to people like me and to also to, to, the, to, to, to sell the game, the women's game, the beauty of it how hard they work, how talented they were. And I do remember that. And I, and I remember her very much cutting down the net. I remember sitting in, in Gund Arena like they're doing that. But then the next day, we orchestrated a trade. I, I, I was, had just gone to San Antonio. We were rebuilding. And I traded the number two pick uh, for Becky Hammond. And Becky Hammond went on to become a great player at San Antonio. Uh, went on to coach eight years in the NBA and now has won two championships. And I orchestra we orchestrated that trade that very day after the Final Four championship game. I think there was three years before me when I came, and I was here four. So probably six or seven years it was here. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, the crowds in Cleveland were, were very consistent with wherever we played and, and sometimes greater than wherever we played, you know, in regard to it. Uh, the thing I always liked was that, that there was a definite attachment between the fan base and the team. Coach, the, the Cleveland Rockers, I think, is very special because the women play with such emotion and such intensity that it makes my job very easy. 
I think when you have a team that feeds off what the fans do and then the fans also feed off what the team does, it creates a very special situation. And our fans definitely gave us one of the best home court advantages, I thought, in the league. And it showed. I think the players did a marvelous job of fostering that. I think the promotions and people that they did it, but there was a um, definite loyalty that you felt in that. And it was a period of time where we were probably more successful than the other pro teams in town, the Browns, the Indians, and, and, and the like. Um, but you, you felt very much like uh, there were a lot of nights I would work late and then go over and watch the Indians play. I'd, I'd work and, and get over there by about the second or third inning, sit out in the bleachers and watch the Indians play and just kind of wind down from a, from a day. Uh, but th being a part of that professional landscape here in Cleveland, uh, identifying with and bringing, I remember bringing people to the women's game to watch and I would tell them, you got to see it in person. I appreciate television, but you got to see it in person. and and Getting the feedback, you know, about the players and about the game that they saw. And I remember a lot of that going on in those early years here in Cleveland. Well, coaching for the Rockers, uh, you know, being able, you know, to go to a press conference in Cleveland, uh, <laughs> seeing your name on the plane dealer. You know, this, this, this is a guy who grew up in Ohio. I, I mean, I... That was pretty special. And I had my son, who was two years old then, at the press conference. Uh, I, I still remember that. The fact that we had a major turnaround the first year um, and went to the finals, uh, you know, that was a great memory. Uh, watching Susie McConnell Serio. So in her last year, retire. Susie had been a great player that hadn't really had a chance to play professional basketball. Uh, had a family, uh, didn't go overseas like the women did then. But watching Susie have a year that she could leave uh, on a high note. Uh, in an opportunity of a lifetime being able to play professional basketball. You see my husband, and you see my four children, and they allowed me the opportunity to play professional basketball, and they are the reason, the primary reason why I knew I need to retire. You know, there, there were so many women that didn't have that opportunity, you know, didn't have a chance to play professionally here in the United States, and to watch that happen, to watch her kids get a chance to share that, and for her to end on a high note. That, that, that was about as good uh, as it could be. But the next year, we won even more games. Um, I was coach of the year, which is, which is nice, but it's very representative of the team and the staff that you had uh, in regard to it. But just uh, having the ability to, we had gone almost a year and not lost a home game. 
Now, things like that, you know, to a coach, you just, you just like love that. And we had gone from a team that the first year we, we won all our home games and lost just about all of our away games uh, to a team that now on, on home and away, we were, we were consistent. Really enjoyed that. But then the things with the players were just amazing to me. Uh, Helen Darling's a great story. Um, the one down year we kind of had, Helen uh, gave birth to triplets and missed the season. Um, and, but watching her go from delivering triplets to playing the next season, we're back in the playoffs and things like that. Uh, it's just amazing. And now, full circle, her, her daughter starts at Oklahoma as the uh, starting point guard. And I do some Oklahoma broadcasts. And the joy of seeing, seeing her as this player and, and Helen and, and Helen's kind of life story coming through. There, there, there's all kinds of stories like that. And you just really appreciate Penny Taylor, who we drafted at 19 from Australia, now it went into the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame last year. You know, uh, Susie went in. Janice Braxton, who was my assistant, she's in, she was in that. Cheryl Reeve, who was one of my assistants here, uh, has now won four championships at Minnesota in the WNBA. Uh, Lisa Boyer, who uh, was my assistant for three years now, has been with Don Staley in South Carolina now for, for their incredible run. Uh, I coached on the Olympic staff, which was, uh, Don Staley was the head coach, but Jennifer Rosati was a rocker and played for us, and Cheryl Reeve, who is now the Olympic coach, was also on the staff with me. So what these, these young women coaching, uh, um, uh, playing, have done with their lives. It's just to be treasured. I mean, there are so many of them in Patricia Bader Benford's the head coach at Montana State. So many of them have have really continued in basketball in some pretty pivotal ways uh, that that are just amazing. Rocker memorabilia. I, I might have the best collection probably and certainly in the state of Ohio, but uh, my first year that I was with the Rockers, we had a nice turnaround and we had a little dinner at the end of the season. You know, a lot of times and you're, you're by then, you know, they're kind of tired of the coach uh, <laughs> occasionally, but this was a year where at, at the banquet that we had, they were nice enough. And here's a picture of it. I actually have a picture of it. Marlakia Jones, Lake was great player on that team. Uh, they presented me with a guitar which I think is absolutely one of the best gifts I'd ever got. You know, Coach Dan Hughes, you rock. Cleveland Rockers 2000. Now, I, I haven't mastered playing it yet, but this, this adorns my home and, and always has. And, and that was a very, very special moment coming out of it. Uh, you have to look at the, everybody loves bobbleheads. That was Marlakia Jones. Okay, a great player from Florida who uh, was called the, the Lake Shake. Uh, Penny Taylor, we drafted at 19. Uh, Penny has gone on to have a, a great career. She left here and went to Phoenix and multiple championships. Also just went in the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. But well, we also in 2000 introduced Rocky.
Now this is Rocky Raccoon, and for you Beatles fans out there, that comes from the, the song on the White Album. Uh, I identified with Rocky uh, in a lot of ways. Matter of fact, when he was introduced, I, I was here, it was my first game, my first win at Cleveland against Washington, and he gets introduced, and I come out, and I give him a big hug, because I just thought it was pretty cool. I was pretty excited. Uh, and it, it, it led to a pretty convincing win that day. But you got to love bobbleheads coming out of it. Everybody needs a lunchbox, okay? Especially, you know, when you're on the bottom there. And uh, this, this was one of the promotions that, that we had in 02. Uh, this is a rare thing here. This was signed, I believe, by the... 2001 team, looking by at some of the names coming out of it, but that was kind of the rocker's emblem, and uh, this was really neat. We, we, we played Cleveland, uh, Cleveland played Orlando, they were called the Orlando Miracle. And Welcome to Cooking with Rocky. This evening, Chef Rocky will be preparing the ultimate pregame sandwich. We start off with two slices of bread, preferably white, although wheat or rye would work nicely. We follow that up with a crisp slice of lettuce. Ah, fresh lettuce. And some American cheese. We cannot forget American cheese. Next, we add a slice of salami and a slice of bologna. Yes, bologna and salami. They both work so nicely. Next, we top that off with two fresh slices of tomato. Red, ripe tomato. And two slices of pickle. Dill or sweet will work admirably. Finally, you take your knife and add a thin layer of the best. Rocky, Rocky, is something wrong? Which isn't a sandwich until we whip the miracle! And I think we were the two seed, they were the three seed. So back then, the way it worked, you opened on the road. And we had to open in Orlando and lost. Uh, so then we had to come home and win two games in Cleveland. And we win the first game. And set up this game here, and this is this. These were the shirts that that people wore for that game three. One game three, uh, just really guarded well, uh, and that, and then uh, went to the finals and had had another home game against New York that we won, uh, and then New York won two games there, so we didn't make it to the finals. But th those were, it, it, back then they, they had a lot of trading cards. You know, the, the there's Susie McConnell Serio uh, trading card, Penny Taylor trading card, Helen Darling trading card, Mary Andrade, now the assistant at Toronto Raptors, Ann Waters. I'm gonna be shooting a, 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 a video for her documentary. Ann was the first draft pick in 2000, she was 19 years old from Belgium. We had a lot of international influence. Rusha Brown's done, done some amazing things as a great speaker and uh, was a great rebounder, defender. That's me, what I used to look like in the younger days. Uh, Merlekia Jones, who I've mentioned, Trisha Bader Benford, who was the, uh, now the, for almost a decade been the Montana State coach. Chastity Melvin, who has coached in the WNBA as well as, as high school. Pollyanna Johns was a Michigan grad uh, who was a great rebounder for us. But uh, all these different things, you know, uh, very much represent a, a time and period where I thought there was some great work done by the Cavs organization. We, I, I worked with a woman named Gail Baby Cream who ran 
our operation and was phenomenal, just phenomenal. Now runs all of my heart, which is a business, you know, near uh, Akron. Uh, she was a great leader. But also, we, we had creative people within the Cavs organization. A, a, a man, unfortunately, who was left us named Mark Heffernan did the music videos. Uh, my wife and I spent last night revisiting those music videos. Oh my gosh, they were unbelievable. They were just literally unbelievable, creative uh, in so many ways, incorporated the music at the time uh, coming out of it. And I think in, in, in so many ways, there was, it was a product that I'm very proud to have been here. Um, I know my time was only four years here, but wouldn't trade it for the world. And now it led up, I think, in many ways to, to this moment, which that was the final four in 207. And ultimately, it's going to lead to the final four here in 2004, 2024. To begin with, Cleveland's a special city for me, so I begin with that point. But there's lots of great reasons why this is going to be a very special moment. But, but Cleveland, to me, uh, I, I tell people, and it's not a lie, you know, when I left Ohio and went and coached in San Antonio, Texas, and then in Seattle, I vacationed in Cleveland. I wanted to come back here. There is something incredibly special about this city. Uh, some of my favorite highlights of my life is waking up early on a Cleveland morning and walking downtown, uh, usually with a cup of coffee, but just walking the city and feeling the vibration and seeing the Rock Hall, seeing the convention center, seeing Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, seeing the, the, where the Guardians play, where the Browns now play, remembering Municipal Stadium, uh, remembering the flats and walking through that and different things. I, I used to be a jogger and, and I would jog Cleveland and I had a little route that took me through all some of the highlights. Now I'm a walker. But there's something very special about this city and, and, and what I see this Final Four being is an opportunity to, you've got an escalating product on the women's side, and especially with the Final Four. I, I believe in 18 minutes they sold out the, the tickets for this game. Um, you've also got, I think, the buzz in the city will, will allow the world to take a look at Cleveland. And I think you're seeing Cleveland ascending, I think, in so many ways. You're seeing women's basketball ascending. I see this as an opportunity for, for two different ascending products to put on display um, a, a product that, that will, will kind of express both of them as, as the greatness that I think they both have, you know, in so many ways. And I'm, I'm excited for it. I'm excited because I think uh, celebrating the women's Final Four is something that I've been to in, in all kinds of ways through the years. But in Cleveland, it takes on a different kind of meaning to me. I very much want for, for all the people to see what I already know, the greatness of Cleveland, and, and put it on display and then ultimately let ESPN and TV take let the world take a sneak peek of why this is such a special city. The Rock Hall? Are you kidding me? I mean, you can find time to zip down there. The Guardians, oh, you, you can stay one more day, and you can see the Guardians open their season at home opener the day after the final, and then you got the Eclipse coming. I'm just telling you, and, and Cleveland's going to be one of the special places to really experience that. Whoa. It's a merging of a lot of, of different things to, to make, I think, a great moment. I think it, you know, last year there were a lot of records set, but, but I'd have to be honest with you. I, I think they're, it, it, they're probably going to go one up on those moments um, because the women's game is an ascending product. And I think what's going to start to happen is you're going to have marketers, you're going to have businesses, you're going to have people. Uh, there, there's some new TV deals coming up in the future. And, and this product, this women's 
NCAA Final Four and, and women's college basketball and women's basketball and women's sports in general, I think it's going to be a, a, a mark that here's where I think we took a big step and it was recognized, you know, not only financially but by attention and, and, and eyes on product coming out of it. And Cleveland's going to be where this goes down. And Cleveland, people are going to be in the city in a way that when you're having this kind of watershed moment, you also are in a city where you're seeing a lot of the same things, you know, kind of play out. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big music guy, and, and, and Taylor Swift, for example, is everybody seems to talk about her. But, but the culture that she creates I see a little element of that ascension that, that I see. I see it happening in women's basketball, and I see it happening in Cleveland. And so from a comparative standpoint, being a music city that Cleveland is, I'm excited to be in harmony with that moment.